Hi, welcome to YTV and this week's segment of Everybody Has a Story. Charles Bolden is the current administrator of NASA. Prior to his appointment in 2009 by President Barack Obama, he served as a U.S. Marine Corps general and a NASA astronaut. He's been brought to campus by the Yale Politic Magazine, and he joins us today. General Bolden, thanks for being here. Cody, it's good to be here, and you can call me Charlie. Charlie, it's all right. It's much easier. All right, sounds good. So I, I understand you're the first African American to ever hold uh, this position as administrator of NASA. I want to go back uh, a, a few years. You grew up in the segregated South. When did this dream to, to go into space, to be an astronaut begin? Does this go back to childhood? No, as a matter of fact, I am one who, um, let me get to the answer first. My, my decision to get into the space program came after I met one of my heroes, the late great Dr. Ron McNair, who um, we lost on the Challenger uh, shuttle in 1986. Um, Ron and I grew up about 42 miles from each other. He was from Lake City, South Carolina. I was from Columbia. His mom was a teacher. My mom and dad were teachers. Ron had always dreamed of being an astronaut. And Ron was African American just like I was, except the big difference was I had never thought about it. Ron had thought about it since childhood, and he made it happen. He, um, he actually, there are stories about him. He is infamous for going to the library, the segregated public library in, in Lake City and asking for a book on calculus and one on physics so he could teach himself calculus and physics to get ready for college and, and the policeman coming and everything else. So it was Ron McNair who talked to me when I was a test pilot and uh, told me about his exploits in his first year as an astronaut candidate in Houston. And when he got ready to leave, he said, are you gonna apply for the program? I said, not on your life. And he said, why not? I said, they'd never pick me. And dumb thing for me to say. And he looked at me, he said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. He said, how do you know that they won't pick you if you don't apply? Uh, embarrassed me beyond belief because my mom and dad had raised me to believe in myself and believe I could do anything I wanted to do. And uh, in this particular area, you know, since there had been no African-American astronauts before Ron, um, I just, I just didn't think I could do it. And he kind of shook me to my roots. And so I went back home and started working on an application for the space program. And you applied and you got in? And I applied and I got selected by the Marine. I got nominated by the Marine Corps to NASA through the, through the military process. And then I was selected uh, among the 200 people that NASA brings to Houston over uh, 10 weeks to interview in groups of 20 and finally got selected in, uh, in 1980. And now you are the administrator uh, of, of NASA. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about uh, uh, some, does some topics happen? you have to uh, 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 deal with in, in your current job. Yeah. Uh, um, the cancellation of the shuttle program uh, uh, when President Obama came into mm -hmm. office uh, sparked uh, a race in, in private industry uh, to, to fill that void of, of space travel, especially in l lower orbit commercialization of space. Companies like SpaceX, uh, uh, Sierra Nevada, Boeing. Do you think this is the right direction for space travel, privatization? Um, I think the combination of, of government taking responsibility for the risky, uh, more expensive things, developing techniques and developing technology that private industry, academia, uh, anything else can come behind and take over is the correct way to do it. I think we've proven now through uh, commercial cargo uh, with SpaceX and Orbital Sciences that that was a good idea. Uh, today, when we finally stopped flying the space shuttle, it cost us about two billion dollars a year just to maintain the shuttle. That was a cost of infrastructure, whether we flew or not. Um, the total cost to bring about today's uh, commercial transportation of cargo um, is less than three billion dollars. So we get, in the first contract, we get uh, five years, 20 flights, 20 missions, uh, 12 from SpaceX, eight from, from Orbital Sciences for about $3 billion, as opposed to what would have been $10 billion just to maintain shuttle over that same period of time. Well, since the cancellation of the shuttle program, we've been hitching rides to space, uh, to space with, with Russia, paying them several millions of dollars per astronaut. In light of the situation in Ukraine and the tensions that have arisen, especially over the sanctions that President Obama and the United States have put on Russia. How stable is that partnership? Uh, the partnership itself is, is relatively stable. I won't say very stable. And, and what I would ask people to understand is there's, 
there is a political and diplomatic relationship between Russia and the United States. Then there is a scientific and exploration relationship between Roscosmos and NASA as two vehicles of those two governments. Uh, because, because we're about people, we're a people organization, as is Roscosmos for the most part. Um, we have friendships that have been built over decades. Um, Sergei Krikalov, who, who ran the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center until last year, uh, was a crew member of mine. We, we flew together on the first joint Russian-American shuttle mission. Bill Gerstenmeyer, who runs our human exploration program today, uh, spent a year or two in Russia as an understudy to some of the designers in Energia, which is a company that builds Russian rockets and the like. So the, the personal relationships, I think, are what keeps, the, rela keeps the, the corporate relationship stable. There's always a chance that something really bad is going to happen, but I would, I would refer people to how we survived with the International Space Station through uh, the Russian invasion of Georgia. Uh, diplomatically, the U.S. worked. Politically, they worked with the Russians and finally got, I mean, that's still not solved, but, but we continued our relationship. Well, you mentioned the International Space Station, which you've described in the past as the United Nations uh, of space. But looking forward, as we advance in technology and go into space even more frequently, do you think that that kind of global unity is sustainable? Will we start claiming parts of space for national sovereignty? I don't think so, and I don't think, I don't think the international community is going to allow any nation to do that. The United Nations, the United Nations, not, not talking about the UN of space, the, you know, the space station, the United Nations spends a lot of time in trying to come up with uh, what are called international uh, norms or international policies for behavior. And, and sometimes we can get all of the countries that are concerned to be signatories and sometimes we don't. Uh, but I think it's going to be most important that people understand that space belongs to everybody. Uh, there are some ticklish areas like asteroids. We're looking at, at uh, trying to redirect an asteroid from its normal trajectory around the sun to get it close enough to the moon where the moon's gravity draws it in and then we can go uh, from the asteroid redirect mission and send humans there to interact with the asteroid. That will eventually, probably, hopefully, lead to humans actually mining uh, asteroids. There, the international community is going to have to decide how do we determine who has the property rights to that particular asteroid or to that section of that asteroid. My guess is we'll do it much the same way as we do in any other international forum. Uh, you know, you, you go out and you lease parts or you, you give licenses or, or something of that nature. But that, that's in work right now by people a lot smarter than I am in international law. Now, the last few years uh, have not been incredibly kind to, to NASA's budget. Uh, I'm wondering, do you think that the American enthusiasm for space travel ha has waned? I know a couple years back, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist, said, we've stopped dreaming. Uh, do you think that characterization is correct? And, and if so, how do you get that enthusiasm back? I don't think Americans have stopped dreaming. I don't, um, we had an opportunity, I talk about it a lot with people. I think it's a myth that uh, in toto, the people of America were all behind the Apollo program, that there was this overwhelming public support for Apollo. That's not the case, as, as my study of history has shown. Uh, they struggled as much as anything. The president at the time, President uh, Kennedy, you know, who brought about the Apollo era, uh, had to make a decision, should NASA seek to go to Mars or should NASA go to the moon? The big driver then was beat the Soviets and uh, so it was decided that we would go to the moon um, and the nation came along as did all the rest of the world. Well in that speech uh, uh, that John F. Kennedy gave at Rice University, we choose to go to the moon mm -hmm. in, in 1962. Uh, he said we would put a man on the moon by the time the, the decade was out. Mm -hmm. Now the, the goal is Mars. What is the timeline for that? Yeah. And the president's been very specific. The president, uh, it, it's not as dramatic or as um, awe-inspiring, if you will, as was Kennedy's Rice University speech that, that talked about sending a man to the moon and bringing him back before the end of the decade. But President Obama, on the 15th of April in 2010 at the Kennedy Space Center, gave what I consider to be a major space policy address in which he said, by 2025, NASA is going to put humans with an asteroid, and in the 2030s, we're going to put we're going to have humans in orbit around Mars with the intent of landing, and uh, and he means that, and we took it we took him seriously, and that's what we're working on right now with our asteroid redirect mission, 
to get NASA, to get humans with an asteroid, and then with the work that we're doing with with uh, the Space Launch System, Orion as a deep space exploration vehicle for launches in we're December. Working. We launched Orion for the first time December fourth, right now, and it'll be an uncrewed launch, but it'll be a very very critical launch for us. It'll be a critical milestone on the way to Mars, and uh, it'll be the first time in more than 40 years that America has launched a vehicle intended to take humans be into deep space, beyond low Earth orbit, and I think that's a big deal. Now you've uh, said that you want to try and turn science fiction in, into science <laughs> fact. Indulge our imagination yeah. for a second. A uh, hundred years from now, I mean, where do you see this? Is this uh, asteroid mining? How far into the solar system do we go? What's the vision in, in your uh, mind? We have already turned science. I say I want to. I say NASA does turn science fiction into science fact. We make the impossible possible. Um, you know, it used to be that only in a science fiction book could you read about somebody living in space for long periods of time. Today we live and work in space for six months at a time, and we're getting ready to send Scott Kelly and his Russian counterpart this coming year uh, to live on the International Space Station for a year. But 30 years down the road, um, I think and I hope that, uh, that humankind will have made the venture to Mars we will have begun trying to figure out how do we prepare that planet for uh, permanent inhabitants? How do we pioneer Mars as opposed to just exploring it, going out and coming back? Uh, it's a long way to get there. And so if you're gonna go that far, you may as well go there and plan to stay for a while. And I think we're gonna be well underway of doing that. In aeronautics, which is down here on this planet, you're gonna find that uh, airplanes are flying for the most part autonomously. They're not gonna have pilots. Uh, people are going to get on an airplane, they're going to fly at supersonic speeds, if not hypersonic speeds. So a trip to go from New York to, to London is we're going to go back to the days of the supersonic Concorde. Uh, so we'll be flying again supersonically. The difference is through some of the work that NASA has done, we'll be able to fly over land supersonically because we've learned how to deflect the sonic boom away from, from Earth and buildings and the like into the atmosphere. We always uh, end our interviews with a, a speed round of, of some <laughs> uh -oh. fun and, and odd questions. Yes. Uh, first one, Apollo 13 or gravity? Uh, Apollo 13 as the landmark space film. Gravity, awesome. Second one, w was there ever <laughs> a rescue mission planned for the Russian geckos? To my knowledge, there was no rescue mission planned for the Russian geckos. And, and you and I talked about this before going to camera. To my knowledge, again, because I'm just the NASA administrator and they don't tell me everything, we don't have a, a, a U.S. follow-up mission plan for American geckos. No reptilian Cold War coming no anytime soon. No reptilian Cold War coming anytime soon. In fact, we hope that in space there will, we don't want to return to the days of the Cold War. All right, well, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Yes. Uh, next one, I, I know that NASA uh, recently announced that they're sending a time capsule into space of, of tweets. Uh, uh, that Americans can, can send in tweets that they, they want to go into space. Uh, my question is, what is your tweet going to be? I don't tweet, so, uh, <laughs> so I won't have one there. Can I make a suggestion? There. No, I'm not going to do it. No? No. Can no. you tweet at Will Smith and ask him why he's not doing Independence Day too? Oh, good idea. I have a press secretary by the name of Lauren Worley, and I'll work on that. Okay. Uh, in fact, so you, okay. I got it. I'm going to follow why up. I know Independence Day too. I will do that. Okay. Yeah. Last one. Any... Uh, any chance Pluto's going to make a comeback? Ooh, I hope so. I, I mean, I would love to see Pluto reclassified as a planet. You know, a uh, minor planet just doesn't turn me on. But then I'm not a small planet, small body. I'm not the group that classifies stuff. So for the benefit of all children around the world and me, I would love to see Pluto come back, make a comeback. Pluto is now a planet. Charlie Bolden, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. It was great. And as always, thank you for joining us for YTV. I'm Cody Pomerantz, and this has been Everybody Has a Story. See you next time.